Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, today I'm giving you guys an update on my metal planer restoration. Yes, this has been a little bit on the back burner of the last uh, month or so as I've been trying to catch up on some other projects around the shop. However, uh, I have been coming over here periodically uh, and just kind of scraping around on this thing and slowly working this uh, bed down to getting it where I have good contact from one end to the other. And I am proud and happy to say that we are finally at that point where I am calling it. I'm saying that this base is good enough and uh, we're getting ready to move on with this project. Uh, my last video I did on the scraping on this, I kind of told you I was gonna wait till I got it done and show it to you. You've seen enough of the scraping process, so hopefully um, you can kind of get an idea of now what it looks like. I'm going to bring the camera over here. We're going to do a little walk around and kind of let you see what we've got. And uh, I want to address a few little questions and comments that have come up from some folks and try to uh, hopefully shed some light on some things as to why we're doing a few things along the way. So let's go over here and do it. So I'm just going to do a little walk by here and kind of let you look down and see the spotting. Hopefully you can kind of see both sides here. And I'm pretty happy with what we got. Remember that the table that rides on this bed is about eight feet long. And each one of those little dark spots is an area when we blew this thing up where th we're making contact between the two. And that's one of the things you wanna do when you're scraping is we don't wanna have 100% contact from one end to the other or you might get the parts to stick together rather than sliding on one another. You want to have individual points of contact and with the scraping by breaking that surface up that's what we're able to do. And depending on how much bearing you've got as to how many points per square inch you want to have and as we walk down here there are definitely some variations in the points per inch in one place versus another. But I have gotten to the point where at least everywhere I'd say that we're getting some points of contact in at least a third of the way if not the entire distance of the way like down here on this end you know we're getting contact up here in the top not as much in the bottom it actually picks back up toward the end but that's good enough there are a lot of points of contact over the length of this eight foot long table back here it's about 12 foot on the bed the table's about eight foot long uh, we've got great contact through here now, one question that has come up is, why did I have to do so much scraping on this? You had this thing ground. Uh, and yes, I did. Uh, and the other question that has come up is, well, if the, the bed is out that much, why are you trusting the grinding on the table to actually scrape the bed with? What you gotta remember here, guys, is that when we ground this table, or this bed, uh, it was on a big, huge uh, surface grinder and when we laid it on there, it had contact on the bottom from one end to the other. So pretty much 100% contact. This entire bottom base was being magged down to the, uh, to the work table on that surface grinder. And when it came off of that grinder, it was pretty much perfect from one end to the other. Maybe a little bit of drop off where these ends cantilevered out, but only in a very small area out there on the ends. When we brought it into the shop though, uh, it's no longer fully supported. Now it's sitting on legs. And even though these differences are small, uh, that has influenced these ways. And if you remember back in the earlier video where we shot this with the auto collimator, we saw that very easily. Uh, when you looked across this, I think from one end to the other, it was maybe just a little over a thousandth of an inch of variability in the, in the height of these ways as you went along and it was higher over the three areas that it was contacting you kind of got a little bit of a dip in between these other two here a little bit of a sag and uh, when you start measuring things at the level of precision that we're doing I mean a thousandth of an inch over 12 feet that's not a lot technically it's within spec Technically, the day it left the factory, that would have been good enough. We're trying to make it better here. We're trying to make this thing as close to perfect as we can get it. We're never going to get it perfect. But that's the reason why things have changed from when we left the 
the grind shop to when we came into the shop. Even making adjustments in the leveling of peat on this thing can still make differences in how this thing is going to print out as we go across here. It's actually pretty amazing how much you can move a machine just by moving a leveling screw and how much you can twist and bend ways by doing that. Again, we're talking thousandths of an inch, but in the world of scraping, that's a, that's a big difference. Now the table back here, it's a different story. It was ground again, fully supported, but when this machine is sitting on its ways, it is pretty much fully supported. So you don't have those dynamics going on with the individual feet. I am confident that the, that the grind job that was done on this table is pretty darn good. In fact, when we measured it in the shop, it was near about perfect. And I am confident that it is still in that good of a shape. Uh, we're going to do some scraping to it. We're still going to fine tune it, but I'm not expecting to have to do near the amount of work we had to do to get this base done because of the difference in the, 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 the bearing areas that we have it set up in the shop versus what we had it set up on the grinder. So hopefully that answers some of your questions about why I'm trusting this and why we had to make so much uh, scraping over here. But right now, I think we're good. I think that we're in actually excellent shape. Uh, I'm very confident this machine is 10 times better than it was probably the day that it left the shop. At least this bottom half is down here right now. So uh, good job on that. I thought it was also interesting as I was doing all my scraping each pass, I would uh, take all the shavings that, that were scraped off of there and I put them in this cup and kept up with them. I'm sure we lost a few that were flung out here and the other, but this is the bulk of the, the cast iron that had to be scraped off of that to get it where it needed to be. And I was just looking, it's got a scale on the side of this container. It's about 90 milliliters on volume, which about three ounces, three fluid ounces not in weight, but in volume, um, is what we collected off of there of just iron shaving. So uh, it's a lot of scraping. I'm very thankful I have a Biax power scraper to move all that metal with instead of uh, having to do it all the old fashioned way <laughs> with your muscle. That would have been a lot of work. This is by far the largest uh, scraping job, at least in area that I've ever dealt with. Although people have done much, much bigger jobs than this. Uh, I promise you. But anyway, thought you guys might enjoy seeing all the shavings that we pulled off of that. As far as next steps go on the metal planer, the next step is, is that we need to get the table scraped into the bed. So now that we've kind of used this as our master, right now um, we've just got ground ways on this. And an argument could be made to just leave them ground and let it go. Uh, in fact, a strong argument could be made for that. If you look at a lathe bed, that's how you do it, where you have the actual Vs. In this case, it's the opposite. Uh, you got a, uh, the, it's, it's like flipped up, upside down from a lathe. The lathe bed, you know, the, the Vs would be pointing up. In this case, the Vs are pointing down. But if you look on a lathe bed, typically those are ground, and then you scrape your saddle that moves on there uh, to the ground surface. I think that would be perfectly fine. However, uh, there are advantages still into scraping uh, this. We can get a better match, number one. We can actually make the two products, pop, uh, two pieces together even better than they are now. Uh, and two, again, one of the reasons why we scrape uh, is to get those individual points of contact rather than a long flat surface. Uh, and it really just kind of helps the pieces glide up across one another. They glide on that oil a lot better when you have that broken surface with those individual points of contact versus a solid ground surface. So I am planning on scraping this. Uh, I am optimistic. I think that's the word I used a minute ago that it's not going to take a whole lot. Uh, I will start by just going down here and putting a cross hatch on it. We'll blew up the V's in the, in the planer bed. Uh, we'll leave this where they don't have any bluing on it and we'll see the transfer between the two. And I'm hoping within a couple of passes, we'll have good contact and everything's gonna be good. That's what I'm anticipating. Uh, now what happens in reality, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I was considering, in fact, I considered it really strongly on this bed. Right now, you know, I've got the ground cast iron, which is the way it came from the factory, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But uh, there is a material called turkite that you can put on 
uh, these ways and it's a modern plastic type material. It's actually a Teflon embedded plastic. Also has some bronze embedded in it. And um, a lot of your modern machines have turkite on your ways and, and it has a lot of advantages over cast iron on cast iron. Uh, and I considered strongly uh, actually lining the, the ways here with turkite. Uh, but at the end of the day, I've decided I'm just going to leave them cast iron, go back to cast iron on cast iron. And um, uh, while there are lots of valid reasons why it might be better to put the turkite on here, at the end of the day, the main reason I'm not going to do it is just is simply the cost. Uh, getting, having to, I'd have to buy a nine foot long piece of turkite 12 inches wide and a uh, couple of quotes that I got on that anywhere from about 800 to a thousand dollars just for the material and um, while again an argument could be made it would be a little bit better uh, I think this is going to be fine in fact I know it's going to be fine to just leave the cast iron on there and quite honestly guys this metal planer when I get it restored is probably never going to see enough work uh, to wear it out again. So uh, I like it. We, it did originally. I mean, I'm more of a hobby shop. It's not like this thing's going to be running 8, 10, 12 hours a day. It's going to be ran occasionally when a job comes in uh, for a short period of time. And it's probably going to sit sometimes for months between jobs. Uh, so uh, I'm not worried about anything like that. And I know for a fact that the cast iron on cast iron is going to be fine. And hey, I can save a grand in the process. Uh, that, that's going to be the plan. We can spend that money somewhere else in the shop uh, and get maybe a little bit more enjoyment out of it, out of that investment. So that is my game plan. And uh, I'll, I'll probably shoot some video with you guys and let you see some of that. But I did kind of want to let you just kind of give you an update of where we were on the metal planer restoration. No, it has not fallen off. Uh, this is something I've been working on. Spent a lot of time getting this thing scraped in. I lost count of how many passes it took. Um, each pass, by the time I have to, you know, blue this table up, pick it up with the gantry crane, come over here, print it, pick it back up, bring it back over here, and then take the time to actually scrape it in, clean up all my shavings, um, you know, uh, stone it down, and then start next cycle. It's, it, it was taking anywhere between 45 minutes and an hour per cycle to do this. And I probably have, I'm guessing, 25, 30 cycles to get this thing to where it's at. So con a considerable amount of time. And that, no, that was not done all at one time. Again, I would come out here maybe and do a cycle one evening and then come back the next day or a couple of days later and do another cycle on it uh, in a little bit of time we got it done. So that's where we're at. That's where we're going. Like I said, I mainly just wanted to give you guys an update of where we were at. Well, just to see exactly how good we did, I decided to break out the auto collimator, shoot these ways and get a good reading to kind of see where we're at. So uh, I've talked about the auto collimator before, and I'm not going to go into great depth on it right now, but basically uh, it projects a light beam through here, it reflects off of a mirror, goes back to it. And I've got this on the sled that's riding in the ways on my machine. I slide this down, take different measurements. It's capable of detecting changes in the angle of this mirror based on how it's uh, laying on that way uh, to, what is it, a tenth of a second of an angle. So you got degrees, each degree has 60 minutes, each minute has 60 seconds. This can take you down to a tenth of a second. And using some math, and I'll show you here in a minute, it'll calculate and actually draw a line of what, what your uh, surface looks like. The variability in height is it's this mirror moves in different positions. Use this same setup uh, for calibrating surface plates. You can detect flatness down to millionths of an inch. Uh, it's a very accurate uh, instrument. Let me show you, I ran the numbers and I'll show you what this way looks like. So I did this same exercise before I scraped the ways and uh, on the, the right way here, you can see this draws a line. It's greatly, uh, greatly exaggerated, uh, but shows how flat or how not flat it is, kind of gives you an idea. All in all, before we started this way here, came out, it was a little over a thousandth uh, total variation from one in, or the maximum variation was about a thou. So uh, after scraping, 
it now looks like this. And again, don't look so much at the, uh, the ups and downs because the scale changed there. Uh, this is now maximum error is four ten thousandths of an inch. So we went from a little over a thou to four ten thousandths. So uh, really, really, it's, it's pretty darn flat. Again, that's over, over 12 feet, uh, four tenths of a thousandth of an inch. Um, I can live with that. I can live with that very well. Uh, I'll shoot the other one probably. I'm expecting similar results, but uh, it should make a huge difference in the, uh, in the overall flatness. Did the same setup here, just went to the other way, shot it from one in the other, and uh, this time around, I think it was, uh, what was it, 4.6 tenths before it was um, 1.3 thou, and we went to 4.6 tenths. So again, huge improvement. I'm very happy, I'm very confident that we got these things, uh, this machine is ready to move on uh, for the next stage of the scraping, get the, the table scraped in, and hopefully we can start really putting this machine back together. Still got some more scraping to do on some other components, but once I get this part done, we're going to be miles and miles ahead, and uh, I'm excited about it. I'm really excited about it that we're finally got a big piece of this work on done on this project. Well, there you go, an update on the New Haven metal planer restoration. We are taking this 1890s, roughly, era machine, rebuilding it, and turning it into a modern, high-precision machine tool, hopefully. That's the plan uh, for the shop here. Guys, that's going to be a wrap. As always, thanks for watching. Uh, please uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thumbs up, appreciate it, as are comments. And uh, we'll catch you on the next video.